Hey friends, this is Melissa Keller, Director of Events and Project Management for Vineyard Worship. We release a new single on the first Friday of every month. Our latest single, You're Always With Us, is a strong and simple declaration of God's constant presence in our lives, featuring the vocals of talented newcomer Kyle Howard. Even in fear, even in fire, even in faith, Walking on water, even in doubt, even denying, even in life, even in dying. Find You're Always With Us and all of our singles wherever you listen to music. I knew I was supposed to be here. Yeah. I knew we were supposed to make this move. So having that, that sense of the call of God really is helpful. If the Lord calls you, it's worth it, even if you mess up and you fail. Yeah. Like, I've failed a number of times. We, we yeah. went to Thailand, wanted to plant a church, it didn't work. I, I started a community center in the, in the South Bronx in New York City, and I wanted to start a church out of it, and I failed. I've had a handful of failures, and yet God still said, okay, now you're going to plant in Syracuse. And I said, all right. And failure's okay. You know, failure doesn't kill you. I mean, That's it really right. can make you stronger if you, yeah. if you learn from it. You're listening to The Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is John Elmer. John is a church planter and the pastor of the Vineyard Church in Syracuse, New York. This episode is brought to you by Monk Drums. Monk Drums is a creative desert venture that strives to combine beauty and business as one heartbeat. Monk Drums' main focus is handcrafted wooden drums that allow us to love, assist, and serve all who accompany us on this path. Use the coupon code FermentPod to get 5% off your Monk Drums order. Find them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Monk Drums. And every Monday, look for hashtag Monk Drum Monday. Speaking from personal experience, monk drums are wonderfully crafted and they sound amazing. They blend the best traits of both the djembe and the cajon, and I found them to be incredibly versatile in both the live and studio environment. Check them out at monkdrums.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap. And all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today. Complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Ferment. Adam Russell here. I am not in Campbellsville, Kentucky today. I have somehow made it to the Northeast for the very first time. I'm in Syracuse. Whew. And I'm sitting with John Elmer. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, man. Um, I've never been to Syracuse before. I was telling you this a minute ago off mic. I've been to the Northeast so many times in the last six years and never been to Syracuse. So um, before we get into the depths of the podcast, what, what's something I need to know about Syracuse? Syracuse, uh, home of the orange. Syracuse University, Orangeman. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I just think of Carrier Dome because I'm a college basketball guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And we beat Kentucky in attendance just about every year. Yeah, but listen, if that dome was in Kentucky, we would crush you guys. Maybe. I, no, maybe I'm telling you. Maybe, I'm telling maybe. you. I'm telling you. If you had two foot of snow, we'd crush you. Oh, that's it. That's okay. it. That's it. Yeah. yeah, turnabout's fair play. Yeah. Okay, so let's just stop here for a second. 
Are you excited about the team this year? I think they'll do all right. I think they're going to surprise people. Okay. Yeah. What's the What's the strength of the Syracuse basketball team this year? Well, their zone's always good, and it confuses people. That's right. And I think they're going to score a lot. Okay. They got some shooters. Okay. Good. Listen, that's uh, in college basketball. That really matters. It does. Yeah. Well, we're going to find out tomorrow night, and of course, by the time this conversation comes out, this will have already passed. We'll find out tomorrow night how real Kentucky is. They, I think they're opening the season tomorrow night with uh, Michigan State. Oh, wow. It's a 1-2 matchup. Wow. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Nice. Yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, the Orangemen. What else? What else should we know about Syracuse? Syracuse is a blue-collar town. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, I love it. I grew up here. Okay. And um, good people. Yeah. Kind of the real deal people. Well, I was I was just driving through the town this morning, and of course, this is just first impressions. Uh, you weren't with me. I've never been here. I'm just driving around, so I don't have a local on the ground showing me what's what. But it feels a little bit like it feels a little bit like Louisville uh, in terms of the age of the city. So something about the architecture uh, has a bit of that feel. So yeah, it's really cool just to be here this morning and getting a chance to to see what it is that's happening here. Okay. Uh, you said you grew up here. Why don't we just start there? Because we almost always begin this podcast with origin stories. Can you just tell us how'd you grow up? Um, did you grow up in the city? Were your parents believers? Uh, did you have any faith? Uh, just shoot with us any way you want to along those directions. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up in Syracuse, uh, born and raised. Um, I grew up uh, Italian Catholic family. And, um, you know, my mom brought us to mass, nothing really stuck, wasn't really any part of what I did. Um, growing up, I, I played sports, I did drugs. Um, yeah, what sport did you play? I wrestled and I played lacrosse. Okay. All right. But you don't have cauliflower here. Well, I was good. I was beating the guys up. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. You didn't, <laughs> you, you were you were handing out the punishment. There you go. That's, That's good. Right. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... You were raised Catholic, but it sounded like you were kind of like nominally Catholic. Yeah, so I really, um, you know, it didn't really have any impact on me. Um, and right before my senior year, I'd, I'd um, you know, gotten in trouble, had to go to parochial school, actually. And right before my senior year, uh, I was out one night and was late and partying, came back to the house, drunk, high. And uh, there was a Bible on the... Um, table right next to our door. And we never had a Bible. I had to buy a Bible a couple of years before f to pass a religion class. Okay. Gave it to a friend at the end of the year. He said, hey, you're going to need this next year to pass, pass class. He took it and he returned it that day. It was August 5th, 1976. And uh, I came in and it was sitting there and I didn't want to go across the living room because I don't know what my mom did, but the room was spinning. And so I just yeah. wanted to sit down and I sat down and I grabbed the uh, Bible and I looked at, read something, can't remember what I read. And uh, the Lord started speaking to me. And as his first real encounter I had with God. When you say the Lord was speaking to you, do you, do you mean like you were feeling something? You were hearing something? Un unpack that if you can. It was, I, I, I'm, I never said it was like an audible voice, but it was as clear as the day. And it was, I felt like uh, Jesus said to me, uh, look how empty you are. Mm. And so um, all of a sudden, you start, these scenes in my life started popping up. I had the year before, six months before, the state tournament was held in Syracuse, uh, lost in the finals. But here I was getting a, a, a medal in front of a war memorial that was packed, you know, 6,000 fans, hometown guy, you're cheering. I'm on the stand. And I remember saying to myself, there's got to be more to life than this. And then a scene like from three weeks before, I was in my backyard getting high. And uh, I remember saying to myself, there's got to be more to life than this. And there was a scene of getting in trouble in school. And it was like, as I was getting brought down to the principal's office, I think there's got to be more to life than this. And, and all of a sudden, these scenes just kept popping up. And it like just made me cry out there in my living room, you know, well, well what can fill this? And this voice came back as clear as day. And I'm not saying it was audible, but it was as yeah. clear as can be. It was as I can. And, and you knew that to be Jesus. I knew it to be Jesus. You know, uh, I, and from my going to mass, I, I knew that Jesus lived and died 2,000 years ago. I kind of figured he was in heaven. Uh, I didn't think he really carried much about 
what was going on in my life. And uh, so I said, wow, I, I, I need to tell you, I'm, I'm sorry for all the mess I made. I knew I hurt a lot of people. I hurt my mom. I hurt, you know, just did stuff that wasn't good to people, you know, at times. And um, I said, I'm sorry for all that. And if you could fill that emptiness, would you fill that? And I need to know that you're, you're, I'm not just having this crazy experience that this is really happening. And um, at that moment, I always, I explained it like this because I had no words for this stuff. It was like, there was a pitcher of liquid peace that just got poured into me. Now I understand it was literally the Holy Spirit filling me. Yes. And it was just like, ah, and the peace of God filled me. Yeah. Right there that, that evening. In the living room. About 2 a.m. in the morning. That's amazing. What's really amazing to me about that story is, yeah, you go to Mass, in your words, nothing took. You're out partying. You come in. You read something. You don't even remember what it is. But just in a real, I guess you would say, sovereign moment, God begins to deal with you. You know that it's Jesus and that you respond to him. And there's not really anyone around. There's no sermon, right? There's, no, there's not a friend helping you. It's just kind of like God is doing this at his own pleasure in your living room. And that fact has just filled me with thanksgiving. Uh, like whenever I'm like feeling down or useless or whatever, it's just like, wait a minute, God pursued me. That's right. Like this snot-nosed kid that was just causing trouble. Yeah. He loved me enough to pursue me. Okay, so then what happens? Like you're you're you've said yes. You said I want this emptiness filled. Liquid peace comes into your life. Do you start going to church? You start reading your Bible? What do you do? Yeah, I'm going to mass with my mom, but right away what I did was I knew there was something about this Bible. So I start reading it. And um yeah, you know, I'd put my headphones on, listen to Pink Floyd and that's right. And and you know, of course, that's how you read, right? Yeah. And uh I started reading it. And I, I, I was actually always a reader, even though I didn't do well in school. And uh, I would tend that when I read for pleasure, I'd go out, I'd get high and read it. And I would do that with the Bible. And I'd put the headphones Hilarious. on. About, about a week into this, Hilarious. two weeks, I feel like the Holy Spirit says to me, again, I'm just learning how to hear it from the Holy Spirit. Says, no. You know, you don't have to, to get high to read my word. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah that's good. And... Uh, you know, you could lose the headphones too. You know, it's like you know, drop the Pink Floyd while you're yeah, reading. You don't it might need be you don't need the epic David Gilmore <laughs> s solos, right? No, um, and so uh, I start doing that, um, going to mass with my mom, and I um, I read in their uh, bulletin. There's going to be a charismatic prayer meeting. I didn't know what that meant. I thought prayer. I should do more of that. That sounds good. So I go to it. Long story short, I meet this priest there who had been chasing me around, trying to, you know, um, <laughs> knowing all the stuff I was causing to happen, trying to make me not have that happen. And uh, he says, what are you doing here? I said, what are you doing here? And he said, let's go out for pizza. We go out for pizza. I tell him my story. And then um, about a week later, he calls me up and says, hey, I got somebody you know. Uh, we're going out for pizza. Let me pick you up. And so I said, sure. We go out to pizza. And in the middle of the meal, he says, hey. Tell him what happened to you. And so I'm sharing my story uh, with this kid and this fellow high school student. And we lead him to the Lord right there in a the pizza place. And then uh, like two months after this experience with Jesus, he says to me, you should start a Bible study. I said, great. What's a Bible study? Because I'd never been to one in my life. He says, oh, you just sit around, read the Bible and talk about it. So I said, oh, sure. So I invite some people. I go around to all my friends who've never been at one. And I go, Hey, you want to come over to my house? And by uh, the way, I don't know what I'm doing, but come over, <laughs> come on over. Yeah. I said, we're going to light some candles, read the Bible and talk about it. And finally some guy goes, what's with the, why do we ever light candles? I said, I don't know. I think it's religious. I think you're supposed to do that. You know? Hilarious. And uh, we did some, we did a Bible study and it grew and two months old in the Lord, this guy had the wisdom and leadership to see something in me to call it out and allow me to, to do ministry right from the start. Well, you know what I hear in your story there that's really fascinating? Two things. A, I hear God is just moving sovereignly in your life. You're hungry. You go to mass. You meet the priest. And he hears your story. And then he invites another kid. And he has you tell the story. And it's like it instantly, it, 
this evangelism thing is working through you for other people. And then he's asking you to go, well, go ahead and lead something. That, that's an amazing leader thing. But then I also just kind of wonder, you know, how much of this is just some of the the precious work of Jesus, even in your own life, to lead people to to him. And it's and it's present. And you don't even know what any of it means. Right? True. true. Yeah. 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 I just think that's really fascinating. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So you do a, a Bible study. Does it grows and then and then what happens? Like is your mom going, John's lost his mind, or she's so happy? What's what's going on in the family? Yeah. You know, I think my family thought I lost my mind for a while there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wasn't the most graceful. You know, I was so excited and wanted everybody to have this and, you know, was uh, sharing it. And, uh, uh, but they began to see real change in my life. And the cool thing is uh, both my, my brother and my sister both ended up getting saved, coming to our church um, years later, you yes. know, the church plan here. Uh, my dad... Uh, get saved when he is uh, 78. Wow. Get to baptize him at 80 right before he passed away. You're kidding me. And it was incredible. Okay, Never... can we just can we just go into that just for a moment? Like, did you get to lead your father to Jesus? This, this you know, so I shared a story about Jesus with him for years. Um, and he, he, you know, really struggled with alcoholism um, and didn't win, you know, except for about five years before he passes. Anyhow, so right before that, I invite him. I said, Dad, it's Father's Day. I am going to be telling a story about you and my message. I'd really love you to come. And so he does. My son picks him up, brings him to church. And I tell this really moving story about him. And there's not a dry eye in the place except for my son and my dad. That's right. (laughs) And you know Josh. And Josh is like, I know Josh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, so he he says in the next week. He says, I said, you want to come again? He says, Yeah, I'll come again. Starts coming. You know, I am so thankful for the vineyard, especially the vineyard in Syracuse, because there's not a lot of places he could come and be accepted. Uh, he was rough around the edges. Uh, you know, uh, smoking up a storm, uh, and uh, everybody just loved him and accepted him and. He came again and again and again and ends up having this experience. And um, before he passes, he says, I, you know, I want to get baptized. And by that point, he couldn't even get to church. And we just had family around him in his apartment. Um, and we baptized him there. It was, it was maybe the highlight of ministry in my life. Amen. What, a, what an amazing story, especially for people who are maybe listening. And, you know, they really have had faith encounters themselves, but... They want this for their family and, you know, maybe it hasn't happened yet. That's such an encouraging story. And I love that you got to be instrumental in your own father's faith. Mm. You know, because we oftentimes think of it the opposite way, right? Fathers are shaping their son's faith. I think that's really, yeah. really beautiful. Okay. So you meet Jesus. You're an accidental charismatic Catholic. When, when did you meet the vineyard or John Wimber? What is that story? So um, that I ended up going to college. I, I had wrestling scholarships to go and uh, ended up feeling like the Lord called me to this little Christian school. So I went there instead of these different scholarships and uh, graduated. Long story short, I ended up going out to California to, to be trained as a missionary. And uh, we move out there. And my wife and I, married to Gwen now by this point, and we start um, going to this church and we were kind of uh, in a radical lifestyle. Like we, we kind of swore off materialism. We lived in a very poor area in LA. We, um, I only had like two pairs of pants. It was army fatigues and a couple of black t-shirts. And I was at war against materialism. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, and materialism won in the universe. So I, I, I didn't yeah. really defeat it yet. Uh, <laughs> um, and so that was all going on. And I go to this church Somebody had recommended from, uh, I was at the seminary. It was a good church. It was an upper middle class church, solid Bible church. And I'm, I'm just there minding my own business, trying to grow, learn, not, not bothering anybody really. And the pastor comes up to me and says, uh, he asked to meet with me. I thought, oh, he's going to ask me to do a small group or something, you know? And he says, uh, you don't fit here. You need to go find another church. No way. 
and I, 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 that's what I said, excuse me, I was shocked. Yeah. And he said, uh, no, you don't, you don't fit here. You, you should go to another church. And I, I was just so shocked. Well, where do you have any recommendations? And he says, I, I heard about this church, the vineyard there. They, they, <laughs> are, they care about the poor. They believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh. You should just go there. That's how I heard about the vineyard. So you get you get kicked out of a church, and he he's a decent enough pastor that he sends you to the vineyard. And, and the thing was, Hilarious. So we didn't even have a car, so we were living. It was an hour and twenty five minute uh, city bus ride no. from our stop to the vineyard. Were you going? Did you go? So, to, was it Anaheim? Was that where you were no, going? No, no, it was where uh, Santa Monica, okay. West LA Vineyard. Oh my gosh! So we were kind of near downtown at yes. the time, and we had to take that bus out there and we get out there and it was meeting in this uh, uh, Mexican movie theater and, you know, kind of run a little run down and we get in there and we walk in and it was just the presence of God hit me. Yeah. And from the instant I walked in, I knew I'm home, you know? Yeah. And I've heard versions of that story that end with the words, I'm home so many times. Yeah. What, what was it about that moment that made it feel like home? Was everyone else dressed in army fatigues, having a war on materialism? <laughs> what was it? I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I was the only one in that war. <laughs> I just love that image, but not to take it off the story, but that image is just too good. Yeah, but what was that? What was that moment? Why did it feel like home? It was there was the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it was incredibly rich, and I I didn't even have language for that at that time. I just knew it, you know, that this was different. This God was here. Um, the worship. It was, you know, it's the mid eighties. It was cutting edge. It, it was in, you know, the West LA, Santa Monica area. The The music was incredible. The skilled people they had. Yeah, I'm but, sure they had artists. Oh, unbelievable, you know? And, um, but that presence of spirit and he gets up and he preaches and preaches this incredible practical message from the word of God, um, a sense of uh, community there and knowing what, you know, just looking at the bulletin, seeing all these things they did for the poor, it was like this perfect combination. I thought this is what the kingdom of God should look like. So how long did you stay at that church? I was there for three and a half years and they actually sent me and my wife, we went as missionaries to, to Thailand, to Bangkok, Thailand. And then we came back, uh, we lived in the squatter slums there and uh, my wife got real sick. We had to come back. And when we came back, they brought us on staff. Okay. And so I was on staff there for three and a half years. And what kind of pastor were you on staff? Were you just oh. like an associate pastor? I thought you meant good. It's not yeah, so no, good. No, no, no. I say yeah. mediocre. Mediocre. <laughs> uh, five, out of, five out of 10. Yeah. No. Were you like a staff pastor? Were you an outreach pastor? What were you doing when they brought you back? I was uh, the family and children pastor. Okay. Yeah. All right. The church was about 70% single. Okay. And the fact that I was married qualified me to do that. That's you know? right. And so uh, that's where I started with the vineyard and pastoring. That was 87. Okay. So if you had formative experiences in the vineyard in the mid eighties, did you have any encounters with John Wimber? Did you, did you ever meet John? I did. Yeah. Uh, a couple of times personally, like I, we were at all the big conferences and all those yes. things, got to see him all the time there. Um, but when um, there's one time, this was a little bit late. Actually, I moved, I was in Syracuse at the time. He was doing a class in Pittsburgh. And I heard about it, a seminary there, just a week long thing. So I register for it and I um, uh, write his office and say, hey, I'm a vineyard pastor from Syracuse. He was at an Episcopal seminary. Can I have breakfast with him? And so I said, sure. And me and another vineyard guy got to have breakfast with him all week. And he, he was just, he was funny, he was lovable. Yeah. But you know, like the spirit of God would come and he'd do something. And we, we had breakfast all week. It was great. And at the end, the waitress gives him this big hug. She says, oh, this is the last week. She comes over, gives him this big hug yeah. and then hands me the bill. And then with, <laughs> with a smile on his face, he says, see, that's what you get. You get the bill, I get the hug. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's so good. Um, I, I want to ask you this question too, because a lot of the people who are listening to this podcast in particular, I mean, well, it's all kinds of people. It's pastors, it's worship people, but this podcast right now, anyway, it skews a touch younger, especially in the vineyard. Um, so anytime I'm hanging out with people who have some history and legacy in the vineyard, I'm, I'm trying to mine into this a little bit. Um, could you just tell us 
What was it about John Wimber or the early formational days of the Vineyard that really stuck with you? Like, I think I've heard a little bit of it in that first story you told just when you walked into the, the West Side Vineyard there, the presence of God. But, but is there anything else that, that kind of like sticks out and you go, you know what, that was really important and that, that was connected to that feeling of home? Yeah, there was, uh, I think there was a couple things that, that the vineyard really influenced the whole church about. But in, in the mid eighties, when I stepped in was radical, you know, the whole idea of casual being casually dressed. Yeah. Nobody's, pa- the hierarchy was at least it wasn't for, there was a flattening of that in some ways. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't like the man of God and everybody else. Um, there was that sense of the presence of the Holy spirit and worship the openness to the power of God and the naturally supernatural, that was just, uh, you know, different than anything else that was out there. Yeah. Uh, and and in the midst of all that, the, some of just great Bible teaching and, and care for the poor. Yeah. And I remember when we once saying, I heard him say this a number of times that, you know, if you're not caring for the poor, you're not really a vineyard church. Mm. And that, be, you know, there, there was this combination that some churches did these things really well, one thing or the other thing or the other thing. It felt like the vineyard was a place that was, was the whole deal. That's really strong language too, isn't it? Like if, if you're not caring for the poor, it you're was. not you're not really a vineyard church. That's really strong language, and that's what a challenge, right? Yeah, I, I, I love hearing that. Um, I know I, I didn't hear this in person. I just know this by uh, other people's stories that that John would oftentimes draw the vineyard man, or if we were to say yeah. it today, the vineyard person. I watched him do that on, on on whiteboards. Yeah, and you know, one leg would be worship, but the other was compassion or ministry to the poor. Yeah. And those things go together. And I think a lot of people forget that, that that was so foundational part of what the Vineyard movement was. I think, I think they totally do. And what I'm excited to see even now in the Vineyard is that we're not letting go of worship, but then we also see people and not just people, but churches that have uh, reawakened or never let go of the idea of ministering to the least and the lost and the poor. Um, I'm even thinking of some of the things that people like Kathy Maskell does with the Vineyard Justice Network, just waking people up to the margins of our cities or our communities and that this is deeply kingdom work. Yeah, love seeing that. Um, Okay, so why did you come back to Syracuse? I came back in 91. And if you ever look at the demographic maps of the U.S., there's this huge wave arrow coming from the Northeast of New York to Southern California. And if you look really closely, there's like five people walking the other way. That's me and our church playing team. Okay. Yeah, it's like no one was coming back, you yeah. know? Uh, but God clearly and supernaturally called us back here. Um, we, um, my wife and I knew God was calling us to do something. We fasted for 18 days. God called us to church planning supernaturally. And when we asked where, um, he gave me this verse just when I was like, God, you got to, I'll take my family anyway. You got to give me a verse. And, uh, Genesis, uh, 32, three came up and like, I'm like, what's that? You know, like who knows it? So it's an obscure verse. And I, I grab my Bible and start paging to it to get to it. And I'm thinking, is this like, am I going to Israel? Is it like in Egypt? <laughs> is it, is it, you know, yeah. some obscure little town like Goshen, I'm going to end up in Goshen, Indiana, you yeah. know? And I flip it open and it says, the Lord said to Jacob, I'm sending you to the land of your fathers oh. and I will bless you. And this is my hometown. I bleed orange, you know? And yeah. it is, it is, uh, my dad lived here. My mom lived here. My, my brother here, my sister here, you know, it was, it was where my 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 family roots were, and so what a, what, a, came. what a powerful powerful moment. Yeah, I love that. And even what you were saying a minute ago, it's really funny and true because it's one of the reasons I asked as well. 
Because I think when people think about the vineyard, historically, they would say, well, Southern California. And, and maybe today they would point at some other places on the map, you know, M- maybe, maybe Columbus or maybe Denver or some of these places for good reason. Mm-hmm. But, but God was saying to you, no, go, go back home to the land of your mother and father, you know, and in Syracuse. What a, what a beautiful thing. Um, so when you got here, what'd you guys do? Did you start a Bible study? Did you, yeah. do, did you do a home group? So we started with seven people in our living room, started a Bible study, um, and just started inviting people and gathering people. And little by little, we grew. We never had, we weren't one of those churches that like exploded and doubled in size. Syracuse isn't that kind of town. Yeah. You know, it's not so, so Bible me, Belt. It's, yeah, talk to me about what that means. What, what, what kind of town is Syracuse? You, you mentioned earlier working class. The working class, uh, it has a veneer of Catholicism over it. Um, it is, I don't know if you ever read the, those Barna raiding cities, most unchurched cities. When we first came here, um, Syracuse was like 13th or something in the country, being most unchurched areas. And that, that's pretty much what it was. Um, and so it was really kind of going upstream a little bit. Yeah. So when you got here and you're inviting people to home group, what what are they thinking? Do they think, yeah, that sounds cool. I want to go to a home group. Or are they thinking, this is crazy? Yeah, I'd say more of the later. Okay. Um, but we, you know, once we got out of our home, we gathered, we started up small groups, started meeting Sunday nights uh, in a building we got for Sunday nights. And that helped. At least we're not in a home. And then when we went Sunday morning, that really helped it because it, it's weird, but even non-church people think, oh, ch- church, if it's a, it's a legitimate church, it's Sunday morning. Yeah. And it has its own building. Yes. Anything less than that. And that's where we picked up more traction yeah. and began to grow. But we've steadily increased through the years. Yeah, I know. You guys have such an amazing footprint now and such an amazing like legacy in the city. Uh, Ted Kim is one of my very, very mm. good friends. And Ted sort of like kept me filled in over the years on who you guys are and what you do. And it's such a blessing. Um, I'm, I'm also wondering about this too, John. If you're moving home and this is where you're from, and your mom and dad are here, your brother, your sister are here. And if Syracuse is working class town and there's just that tough northeastern edge to it, how's that affected your preaching? Has it? Um, well... I think I, 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 I'm a Syracuse guy, so I can speak Syracusan, you yes. know, and I, I, I learned early on what I want to do was I wanted to have a church that was uh, real and honest. And that's not a Syracuse thing. Like that was shock. I think God had to bring me out of Syracuse, bring me to Southern California, bring me to a uh, a movement, a vineyard that is open and honest and real. And, you know, in Southern California, everybody was telling their stuff and, you know, it was like crazy openness. And um, I had experienced that and learn and get healed, lots of healing in that process to come back and to be honest here because Syracuse, and maybe it's like some other blue collar towns, just keep your, keep your dirty laundry to yourself. Like, yeah, this is family business. You don't tell anybody else. That's right. And so, so um, vulnerability is not a high priority. No, maybe. no, it isn't. Yeah. And it isn't something I experienced growing up either. Yeah. And so learning to do that and learning to do that in a message, I think shook some things up as well. Yeah. And it was always very, trying to be very practical. It's a practical town. Yeah. Like, give me the tools at work. That's right. Yeah. So even, even when it comes to your preaching, you're leaning towards practicality, vulnerability, honesty. Those are the things that you sort of like picked up both from the town here and then your experience in Southern California. Yeah. At my best. At your best. At I my get best it. I get it. That's it. what we're shooting for, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That's really good. Um, one of the things I've noticed even in our conversation right now is that you really love Syracuse. I do. Yeah, I mean, I can feel it, you know? I do. And I've noticed that when we're talking, that when when you start talking about this city, you smile. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I've noticed <laughs> it. Um why do you love the city so much? Is it just because you grew up here or is it, is it something extra? I think there is a, uh, a greatness among the people, that there is this, this uh, 
there's passion in the city. I mean, that's why we go crazy for a basketball team. There's passion. Right. It, it misdirected at times, but passionate people, that is a, a grittiness. There's a, a, a realness in that. There's a kind of a, a hardworking element to it. Um, you know, and it is my hometown. I, I I love it. And I'm I'm here. I, I told people when I plan it, I'm going, I tell them, like, okay, I just want you to know you can bury me here. I'm the I'm gonna be the last, you know, Syracuse hasn't prospered. And I, I would tell people, I'm I'll be the guy that stays and I'll turn out the lights when everybody leaves. Yeah. This is where this is where God's called me, this is where I am. And there's there's uh it's a great place. I I, I love it. Yeah, no, that, that really comes through and I think it's really, really special when someone can pastor in a place that they actually have passion for. What what we found is in, in church planting in a vineyard was church planters are often more successful when they go back home and they have a passion for that city. And yeah. The success rate is higher. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes yeah. sense. I mean, I, I live in central Kentucky. It's so rural. It's in many ways, you know, at least culturally, it's a lot different than here. Um, but in terms of the working class, uh, blue collar, hard nosed approach, it's definitely very similar, but I, I feel the same way about where, where we live, mm. you know, uh, That's great. Heather and I just feel like, yeah, we're, we're kind of hidden in the middle of the hills of Kentucky, but we know we're supposed to be there. And it's the, yeah. it's yeah. just, I, you know, maybe we could go somewhere else, but I don't think we're ever supposed to. I think this is, yeah. it's our spot. Yeah. So I really connect with that. Um, John, could you also tell me, and for everybody who's listening, could you tell me what what do you think God is doing in Syracuse? You know, um, I can answer that through what I think He's doing through the Vineyard Church of Syracuse. That's Vineyard. right. Um, about five years ago, I felt really clearly that God spoke and said He wanted to use us to transform Central New York, Syracuse area, and um, you know, I cast that to the church. The leadership team agreed with that. We cast it to the church, and there was a lot of excitement and passion for it. And uh, we began to try to create new ways to transform Central New York. And then, about a year after that, I saw this article by the um, Brookings Institute that did a study across the country. They found that Syracuse, the Central New York area, was the ninth most segregated area in the U.S. Okay. And when I read that it broke my heart. Like, this is a town I love. And I miss that. And I knew at that moment that that had something to do with what God wanted to do in Central New York with us calling us to be a transforming church. Mm. And so I began to read and talk with people about that. It, it, um, it was a whole new sphere for me. Um, I know how to grow a, a, a white church. I don't know how to grow a, a multicultural church. Yeah, I'm a rookie. Yeah, and so I began to try to think about that, and um, we began to try to wrestle with that as a staff. One of the things I realized was geography is a huge piece of that. Yeah, talk to me about that. So um, my wife and I uh, really felt like the Lord was saying we needed to move if we were going to lead change. We had to really lead the change. So we sold our house in the suburbs, moved into this uh, wonderful neighborhood on the north side. Uh, the most diverse area in, in Syracuse, uh, full of uh, lots of refugee families. Um, how, long have you, how long have you been in this neighborhood? Um, we uh, we just moved in about three months ago. Okay, and uh, we had a we had a delay. Uh, our block literally caught on fire. We bought this 150 year old historic building. Had been a bar had been boarded up for about three four years, and the block we were revamping re 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 the building and. The block caught on fire, and that sent our whole move a year back. Wow! Um, but it was this move here is uh, part of that whole thing of bridging the gap and yeah. uh, seeing what God's up to. Well, and John, you know what I hear in your story right now is I hear that younger John who was so radical for Jesus and was going to fight a war on materialism <laughs> and. And was just on fire and inviting everybody to a Bible study that he didn't know how to lead. I hear that's still alive in you. You know, I mean, if you're leaving the suburbs and if you're moving here to a really diverse city uh, or a really diverse portion of the city and 
these are big moves. And if you're wrestling with things like diversity and segregation, that's that's really big Jesus stuff. That's really it, wonderful. It's been a it's been a big move. It's been great. I mean, the presence of God has been in the middle of it. It has been. I have gotten to pray for more people in the neighborhood in these three months than I did probably in the 28 years in the suburb. I believe that. Uh, it's been great. And God's opened up doors. Maybe my heart's more sensitive, uh, but it's it's been incredible. That's great. So you guys were praying five years ago about transformation. And it, if, if what I'm hearing is right, the thing that you guys have picked up on is that Jesus has been pointing out things to you all as a church that are rooted in the idea of diversity and segregation. Um, how is how is this city segregated? Is it just, you know, is it just white parts of town and non-white parts of town? Is that kind of what it is? Yeah, um, it is. There is, um, historically, there's a, been a very black area of town. Yes. There's been um, a Latino yeah. area, an Irish area, an Italian area. Um, but now the this, this city of Syracuse is basically, it's either now or, plan, you know, projected to be in the next couple of years, uh, minority majority um, city. Um, and there's a lot of white flight, like in a lot of northeastern cities, um, to the suburbs. So the suburbs are, most of them are generally pretty lily white. And uh, so the, the, the diversity is really in the city itself. Okay. Okay, and so that's why you and your wife wanted to move back into the city to get reconnected to some of the things that are happening here. Is that what yeah, I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys have been praying through and walking through that with Jesus at your church, has that changed the way you've done church? It has. Is and it changing the way you do church? It has. Okay. And it is. And we're not done yet. Yeah. We're still figuring this thing out. Yeah. Yeah. What What have uh, you done so far? So we um, we have transitioned our worship to have a different sound. Like you said, Ted Kim was our worship leader, yes. pastor. Great. He did an incredible job. Yes. And when he came on staff, you know, probably eight years ago now or nine years ago, whatever it was, he was commissioned with, you know, we'd gotten a little bit, if the nineties were coming back, our worship was set for it. Yes. And he changed it and brought it into a modern sound, did yes. a great job. And then the, 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 the next step was to create a more multicultural sound, a more, gospel influence sound. Yeah. So we hired uh, Leon Powell yeah. and he's doing a great job kind of turning that around. And so that's people's worship style is very personal. Yeah. And so it's been hard for some people Yeah. and musicians as well as um, uh, just people coming to church. So that's one of the changes working with our worship to change. Yeah, so you're it. looking to make worship more diverse and inclusive to the neighborhood. Yes, and to the to the to city the whole, that, to the whole to the city that's here. Yeah, we're a multi-site church, so some of our areas are in very uh, you know very white suburbs, and they yet we're going to do it. We're going to do it at all our sites. We're trying to stay pretty one church, multiple locations. So that's that has a cost. Yeah. Begin to talk about this issue, and um, and you know push towards it. Yeah. Give vision, give clarity, yeah. give some biblical things about justice, yeah. which we haven't been far from. But it's funny because sometimes when you touch this area of of racism, yeah. it's very personal to people. Yeah, and um, so it's it's been hard for some people to make that journey. Yeah, well, I, I just think it's I think it's wonderful that you and your church leadership are hearing and feeling the leading of Jesus. Uh, to these issues, because yeah. I mean, it's clear our country is changing. You know, um, we are becoming a more diverse country, and and, and that's a good thing. It's great, yeah. and and hopefully our churches will do the same, and they'll reflect the people who are actually in our communities. Yeah, uh, the thing is, we had a diverse. The Syracuse Vineyard is diverse in this sense. We have hit. We are very multi generational. We are um, as far as politics. There are people on the left, people on the right. Yeah. We are um, diverse in the sense of men and women in leadership, very equal role that way. We have rich, we have poor, but what we didn't have was a, a racial diversity. 
Yeah. And that's what we're trying to grow to be more reflective of, of the King of God. If, you know, you read Revelation, man. That is a uh, that is tribe. an awesome party, man, with yeah. people from every tongue, every language. You know. Yeah. Nobody gets left out. Nobody. Yeah, that's beautiful. Really beautiful. Um, John, would it be okay if we just maybe switch gears here for a second? Uh, I just want to talk leadership with you here for a moment, and I think we've kind of been talking around it. Clearly, you're someone who has been leading things. Uh, from the very moment that you became a believer. And part of what I'm also hearing in your story is that Jesus has spoken to you along the way, either to move to Syracuse or after you're here to make changes at your church, maybe some of the things we've been talking about here just for the last few minutes uh, on the issues of uh, racial inclusion and diversity and those sorts of things. Those are all leadership things as well. Yeah. Um, can, can you just talk to us about what is a good leader? Like you've been doing this for more than a minute. After this many years, what what do you feel like is a good leader? Let's just start there and then maybe we'll build out a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, leadership first starts clearly with character. A good leader has to have character. Um, a good leader has to be willing to work hard. Um, I think some of the key... So those are foundational that no yeah. one would ever argue with. Yeah. Um, I think some of the key things is a good leader has vision in our context, which is most important is vision from, from Jesus. Um, but without vision, it's, it's just going to become, you know, uh, they're nice. I want to be around them, but leadership changes things and vision shows you where to change. So vision, I think is really yeah, critical. With, without vision, we just get caught up in whatever is most, pressing in the, you know, right. whatever's urgent that day, right. rather than pressing towards some bigger goal or some bigger leading from Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So vision, anything else you want to add to that? Vision. Uh, I think great leaders uh, have an ability to take risks, that leadership is all about risks and a cautious leader. Like there's times to be cautious Yeah. because uh, you're leading and you have influence in people's lives. But Great leadership is willing to take the leap, yeah. is willing to, you know, do whatever it takes at whatever cost personally to get the job done that God's called them to do. Yeah. And I've seen, uh, you know, we've planted a bunch of churches at our church and uh, I've seen the churches that make it, those leaders are willing to risk. There's, there's in every church plant, I'll bet in every leader's life, there's this time where it comes where you have to leap. And if you don't, you'll just stay at the level you're at. But if you're willing to leap, you kick through that next level. Yeah. And uh, so many guys, so many people, leaders, have been stuck not being willing to leap. Yeah. What, what, what has helped you take risks through the years? I, I think one of the things was being clearly called by God at different times. So I knew I was supposed to be here. So yeah. You know, I knew we were supposed to make this move. So having that that sense of the call of God uh, really is helpful. Uh, that sense of um, confidence in, in oneself, but also much more confidence. And if the Lord calls you, it's worth it, even if you, you mess up and you fail. Yeah. Like I've failed a number of times. We, we yeah. went to Thailand, wanted to plant church. It didn't work. I, I started a community center in the, in the South Bronx in New York City and I want to start a, commun uh, a church out of it and I failed. You know, I've just had, I've had a, a handful of failures and yet God still said, okay, now you're going to plant in Syracuse. And it's all right. And failure is okay. You know, failure doesn't kill you. I mean, That's it really right. can make you stronger if you, yeah. if you learn from it. you have a word from God gives you confidence to take risks. Uh, I, I love that. You know, if, if we have something that we feel like is from the Lord, we can lean into yeah. it a little more. You know, I like uh, thinking back, you're talking about things, maybe John Wimber mm -hmm. said, you know, you know, I said, we're just changing God's pocket, spend any way he wants. Yeah. So if he calls me to do something and it doesn't work. 
if I gave it my best effort, I was obedient. Yeah. Money well spent in his eyes. Yeah. Well, and I do notice that, you know, it's no one's goal to be a failure. You know, that's not, no, no one's shooting to be uh, a loser or to not have things work out. But I, I have noticed that in the Bible, you know, Jesus is not calling people to be mega successful. He's calling them to just do what he says, right? So the, the Bible's definition of success is ultimately it's faithfulness to Jesus. You know, however that works out, like to use John Wimber's phrase again, change in his pocket, spend however he wants. However that works out, you know, that's not for me to decide. Um, but saying yes to Jesus when he calls, uh, trying to listen, trying to stay soft, trying to stay malleable, trying to stay vulnerable to him and his leadership, that's what really matters. Yeah. Yeah. All right, John, let me uh, let me ask you a couple more things and then, then we'll wrap it up. I, I, I'm interested at least... Um, actually quite a bit in this. What makes your heart come alive after this many years of being a pastor, leading, planting churches, uh, having multi-sites? I think you told me earlier you have five multi-sites now. Yeah. Yeah. What what makes your heart come alive? Man, I love to, uh, I love to see lives transformed. I, I, I love to see people connect with Jesus for the first time. Okay. So we started this site here on the North side six weeks ago. And, um, about three weeks ago, I, I did a, a message to, and at the end, the action step was connect with Jesus right now for the first time. And we had three people do that. And it was like, this is like so worth the move, so worth yeah. gutting this building, so worth painting these walls. Like three people, it's eternity has been changed because of our effort to do that. Yeah. That just that just juices me up, man. That just cause fires me up. And yeah. so seeing that happen is is awesome. And I love seeing people grow into leadership. That's probably, I like the two ends. I yeah. like seeing people start and I like seeing people move into this leadership role in different ways. And so yeah. when I get an opportunity to see that and have those conversations and people step out and do it, that's pretty juice filled. Man, that's good. Hey, can I ask you a question about the way that you call people to Jesus? Can we talk about that for yeah, a second? Yeah. Because you just told that story there. Three weeks ago, you had a message and the action was, let's do business with Jesus right now in this moment. Uh, talk to me about how you, how do you call people to Christ in a meeting? So what I'll do is um, I probably do it 10, 11, 12 times a year yeah. from, from the front. That is a really clear call. And I will you know, talk about it, lead people to it, help them understand what it is. And then I invite them to make that decision right now. Like, you know, here's the deal. And what I, this is how I, I do it. I'll give you the, the, the kind of line. Well, let's just say, you know, right now I'm going to, I'm going to invite everybody to close their eyes. Yes. And um, I want to lead some of you who want to make this connection with Jesus. I want to lead you in a conversation with Jesus. And there's no magic in these words. But I'm just helping you have this conversation. Yes. And if you don't agree with them, don't say them. But you could just say I'm in the quietness of your heart because Jesus is leaning in right now. He has been waiting for this moment. He's pursued you your whole life. And yeah. there's no accident. You just got dragged here by, you know, your girlfriend or whatever. You're, yeah. you're here for a reason. And then I just basically say, you know, repeat it me. Jesus, <laughs> I've messed up. Yeah. I've hurt people. I've pushed you away. Uh, I'm sorry for all I've done wrong. And I want relationship with you. I want to connect with you. I will submit to you. Will you, you know, I, I want, uh, take me, I'm yours. Yeah. And then I pray and I, I just then pray a prayer blessing on everybody who just had that conversation with Jesus. Yeah. And what we do as a church, we have connection cards and people check that he did it. We keep track. So we follow up, we make sure yeah. we aren't getting like somebody did it three times and we count them three times. That's right. And then we follow up with, you know, some stuff for them to, yeah. to learn about it with. That's great. Um, anytime I get a chance, I'm asking people to sort of explain this because I think a, a lot of people are wondering even more, uh, especially as we're like lean into doing church on Sundays and things is like, how do we, how do we connect the gospel to people's actual lives in our Sunday morning meetings in a very practical way, you know? How do we hold the door open for people to come and to meet Jesus? So thank you for sharing that. I, I would say this too. I, I find that there's a tendency for young pastors, and I know you have a lot of pastors listen, to not want to do that. 
And I'm saying, give people a chance, a moment of decision, because in that moment, God, the Holy Spirit's working and there is power in the gospel. And when they hear that gospel and when they get the opportunity, the spirit will, they can cross a line. And that doesn't mean everything's going to be fixed. And that doesn't mean it's going to be a straight line from there, but you got to give them the moment to make that decision. That's right. Why, why do you think, why do you think some young pastors are tentative to, to do some of what we're just talking about right now? I think on the good side, there's, it's, it's people saying, I don't want to make this artificial, I yes. want to have depth with it and clarity yes. in it. And I, I get that. I don't want it artificial. I don't want it just to just be emotional, but God's given us emotions too. And I think on the, on, the, on the weak side of that equation, some may because they're afraid, what if no one does it? And if no one does it, nobody dies. That's right. <laughs> it's fine. You know, it's not like yeah. people are, but here's the thing too, young churches, you got to keep doing it. So that people in your congregation know, because they have people they love that they know don't have Jesus and are going to miss out in eternity with them. And if they know that you will do this, then they're going to be more encouraged to bring people who don't know him yet. Okay. So what I'm hearing you say is that, that if you're a pastor and you make calling people to Christ a regular part of your meeting, I'm hearing you say that people at your church will pick up on that and have even more confidence to bring people with yeah. them. Yeah. And what I do is I let people, not every time through 10, 12 times a year, but key times, I said, look at this next week, I'm starting a message. And the first message is going to be the point at the end is going to be, you can connect with Jesus. This is a great time to invite people it's a great who word. are in nobody's church and don't know Jesus yet. That's a great word. That's a great word. Hey, I also noticed uh, when you were just talking a moment ago, when you were talking, you, you said there's power in the gospel. Um, you were leaning forward. <laughs> <laughs> I think you actually yeah. believe it. <laughs> I, I'm pretty I'm pretty sold on it right now. I think you are. I think you are. Um, John, I don't know you very well, but uh, I just cannot help but think you are just in your bones. You're an evangelist. It's in your story. Like I just keep going back to that first story you told where the priest is like, tell him. You know, yeah. and then here we are, we're, we're talking about this here at the end of the podcast. You're like leaning forward and you've, you took the volume up. There's power in the gospel. It just, it's good. It's just an observation I'm making. Does that feel, does that feel real to you? There's something in that. I yeah, think there yeah, is yeah, something yeah, in yeah. that too. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling that. All right, John. Hey, this is what we do to end every one of these podcasts. There's one more question. Um, I ask everyone, um, I'd love it if you would just share with us a time that you experience great joy. Hmm. And it doesn't have to be the most joyful moment of your whole life either. Just, you know, top of mind awareness. What, what is what is a moment that you experience overwhelming or just really wonderful joy? You know, one thing I think of right off is uh, I really, it, it's full of joy to be around my kids and my grandkids and just hanging around with them and being able to be a dad and a granddad. When does when does that happen? Is there a rhythm? None of my kids live in Syracuse right now. Yeah. So uh, that doesn't happen at the rhythm I would like to see. That's right. Uh, but uh, we work hard to make that rhythm happen anytime we can. Yeah. Um, so there's great joy in that for me. Yeah. There's nothing like a full house, is there? And nothing like a full house. Yeah. With your kids and grandkids running around and yeah. family stories and yucking it up and the whole bit. Yeah. I'm not quite at the stage you're at yet. All my kids still live at home, but I've got one who's 18. Got one who's in first grade too. But um, a lot of times Saturday or Sunday night, all the kids will be home. Maybe they got off work. The olders are not working. They're home. They brought the girlfriends. My two little ones are home too. And everybody's together. There's no, f there's, there's no better feeling than everybody in my house. Yeah. 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 Same. Something great about that. Same. Feel the same way. All right, John. Hey, thank you for um, thank you for just sharing your story with us. And thank you so much for letting me do this. Dude, I think this is going to help people. There's stuff in here that's yeah. actually going to help people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even a brown, brown, uh, blind squirrel gets a nut every once in a while. Yes, right? I think I think there's I think there's a few acorns in here for people. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, if you're listening to this and you are in the Northeast and you're thinking about planting churches or you're thinking about 
leaning into multicultural church leadership, you should you should hit up John and, and Leon and the things that are happening here in Syracuse. Is that okay? That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. we're just going to send them all your way. That'd be great. All right, everybody. Peace. Hey everyone, Casey Corum here, producer of the Ferment Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Just wanted to remind you to check out our latest single, You're Always With Us, wherever you listen to music. Here's a few things you can do to help us. Share a link to You're Always With Us with a friend. Also subscribe to our Sing Together playlist on Spotify. This is where you'll find You're Always With Us and all of our latest singles. All right, people, see you next time. Peace. Peace.